Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it is a signal honor to be here amongst you today. These are familiar uh, settings for me. This is where the Environment Committee meets on a regular basis. I don't get to sit up here. I get to sit where you are. So I spend more time listening than I do speaking. And sometimes that is a good thing for a politician to do. And that is what I have been doing now for several months as I contemplate and consider the reform of the emissions trading scheme. You will be aware that this is indeed one of the cornerstones of the European Union's climate change ambitions. You will also be aware that it doesn't work. And a problem when something doesn't work is how to make it work. And that has been something occupying not just myself, but my seven shadow colleagues over the last uh, four months. So let me spend a little bit of time talking about how we have moved things forward and where I think we will perhaps end up. But before I do that, I think it's important to pay tribute to you, the Committee of the Regions, and to the work which you have done under your rapporteur, uh, Mr. Dus, which is again much appreciated. I think far too often the European Parliament forgets the local, the regional, and the subnational elements as it begins to contemplate its work. And I think we should be collaborating together far more, far earlier, in the process. And so again, I would like to think that this is a beginning, not an end, and that we will find far more opportunities to work arm in arm than we have done to date. So let me then spend a little bit of time looking at how I have gotten to where I am. When I began the journey as rapporteur, someone said to me, it is rather like finding yourself with a large block of marble. Inside the marble is a statue. It is your job to find the statue. The danger, of course, as you chisel off lumps of marble is that the statue can get smaller and smaller until you're left with a very large pile of chips at the foot and very little to show for all your efforts. And that is why I decided to adopt a different approach to developing this particular reform. Rather than simply writing a report and having it die the death of a thousand amendments, I have, over the last four months, drawn together the shadows from each of the political groups to sit down. And we have done so under Chatham House rules. And we have sought to invite witnesses where we can interrogate them until we have answers that we find satisfactory. And we have done that for one simple reason, and that is that far too often we are prejudiced in our views. We already believe we have the answer. This has been an opportunity to allow those witnesses to be interrogated and indeed for all of the other shadows to hear of those interrogations. At the end of each of these sessions, we have then sought to discover where we have common ground. And that has been the beginning, I believe, of that collaboration. I have not selected the witnesses. My colleagues have selected those. They are not politically biased. They are not representative of one group, one party, or one sector. And we have sought to cover every possible uh, element of the groupings who are affected. In doing that, I think also it has helped us appreciate the scale of the challenge before us. And the reality will be that this result will be born of compromise. It will not be my report. I belong to the third largest group in the European Parliament. If the two larger groups don't like it, my report will not be successful. It has been my task to find the center of gravity on each of the issues, to ensure, in fact, that I can find compromise when I'm beginning to draft the report. And in doing that, again, I have drawn heavily upon not just the services of the European Commission and indeed of the Secretariat of the European Parliament, but also, again, upon those rapporteurs. So, we are doing a report in two stages. The first stage is what I'm terming the skeleton report. The skeleton report will be an options report. It will take the key areas where work has to be done, and it will set out the options available to us. And at that point, the shadow rapporteurs will be confronted with a task. Tell me if you have the votes. If you don't have the votes, then we are not going to be doing that. If you cannot bring to the table the votes, then your hope and your aspirations will not be successful. So the point is that what will emerge from the skeleton report, one would hope, is both a recognition of where the center of gravity lies, an acceptance that the agreed position is therefore the likely position to secure that support, and again, 
an appreciation that everyone had an opportunity to have their opinions and their views heard. And as part of that process, the report voted upon earlier this afternoon in this chamber will be part of those deliberations. Now, I will just touch very briefly upon two points which I know will have um, exercised you here. The first is the role of Paris. Paris has set very ambitious, uh, very ambitious targets indeed for climate change. And I will disappoint many here when I say I do not suspect that those new targets will be part of the final report. There are many reasons for that, not because I wish it so, but because too many others themselves are unable to provide us with the information to construct a report on their basis. The second thing is that there is much fear and much concern about the notion of carbon leakage. Carbon leakage is the flight of industry beyond our jurisdiction to areas indeed where there are fewer restrictions. At present, with a carbon price of round about four to five euros, the prospect of carbon leakage is more a prospect than a reality. But if the emissions trading scheme is to work, then we must anticipate a price that will rise and then it will eventually reach double digits and grow still further from there. We therefore have to be very clear of how to afford the maximum protection to industries which are likely to be affected. And we are open to as many suggestions as may be made to achieve this. We are contemplating removing, for example, small emitters from the ambit of the scheme entirely. Small emitters collectively are responsible for 5% of Europe's emissions, but they are one of the most substantial employers. Having hospitals, for example, within the emissions trading scheme is probably not what the original framers had in mind. In addition to that, we will make sure that when free allowances are given, they are free and they are not top sliced. And for those of you who have been knee deep in this, and I do not doubt indeed that the rapporteur has been knee deep in this as well, the cross-sectoral correction factor must be eliminated. You can't offer an organization, a company, or a sector 100% free allowances and then take away 10 or 20% from the top. That's just not fair. Means have to be found to address that. For some, that will be a tiered system. Uh, for others, it may not. But please be assured, our ambition is to afford to those industries which will experience the maximum of pressure and the maximum of challenge, the maximum of protection. It is not my desire it is not the desire of my shadows to drive from our shores the industries. It is our challenge and our hope that we will encourage those industries to innovate their way out of the challenge. And that, I hope, again, will be something which you in this room will endorse. I can answer questions. I can speak. I could speak for hours on this topic, ladies and gentlemen, but I will choose not to do that. I fear I might weary you still further. But I'm very happy to take questions on any issue. And if you are not able to ask them today, I'm very happy to take them on another occasion. So, gentlemen, ladies, Mr. President, Mr. Rapporteur, thank you very much for this kind invitation, and I look forward to the debate that will follow. Thank you very much.